it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, for you our guest for this week, uh, going to be composer Carl Schimmel. Um, Carl is Associate Professor of Music Composition at Illinois State University, and I've known Carl for, um, I think, and coming on almost 10 or 11 years, perhaps. Uh, so I'm going to bring Carl in now. Uh, and there is Carl live. We are broadcasting live, and so as we do broadcast these things live, uh, you get the non-polished uh, experience of me learning how to use Facebook <laughs> and YouTube for these kinds of things as a composer. Uh, first of all, Carl, thank you for coming on, and uh, uh, it's a great pleasure to to have you um, uh, on the second uh, iteration of this show. Um, Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah you know, it's, it's, it, this is a lot of fun for me, and uh, uh, I, I get a chance to talk to my friends and colleagues and share some music. And so uh, I, let's assume that people don't know much about you uh, as a person and as a composer and as an artist. Um, so we'll kind of, we have some time. Uh, what, perhaps without going into like a dissertation, what, uh, what brought you to music, let alone composing? Um, I uh, don't remember exactly. <laughs> But I was uh, I, I was interested in writing mostly. That was like I, I was kind of a creative kid, but I mostly was interested in writing kind of like stories and poems and stuff. And then um, I think I had a friend who could play some piano, and I thought that was kind of neat. So I started piano lessons, and then mm -hmm. because I had this creative impulse anyway, um, soon after starting piano lessons, I was writing my own music. So that was when I was about eleven. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, in Rhode Island. Yeah, that's right. Yep. So I'm I'm originally from Rhode Island. I was born in Pensacola, Florida, actually. But when I was five, my family moved to Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. so yeah. Uh, I've known Carl for a long time. When Carl passes through, sometimes uh, he'll pass through Rhode Island, and he and I will meet up for for coffee uh, somewhere. But you're in which part of Rhode Island? It's on the other side of the bay, right? Yeah, Wakefield, so down mm -hmm. by the South Shore beaches. Yeah. And so. The same town is where University of Rhode Island is. Yeah, that's right. Um, it, it's funny, Rhode Island is such a small state, but um, I feel like I haven't bar barely explored it. <laughs> I mean, it's. Yeah, I've never, I, had, I don't think I've ever been to Bristol until I joined you for coffee at the age of 40 or something. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's kind of like, do you know that it's funny in Rhode, in Rhode Island? So th those of you who've never been to Rhode Island, um, uh, obviously, you know, it, it's a fairly small state, but um, there's, there's a bay uh, and it kind of splits the state. Um, Providence kind of sits at the top of it and, um, and it and it's interesting that the bay acts as this huge geographical divide in the state you know people don't often go across the bay because they don't want to either go through providence or go down to newport and go across the bridge but um, even, you know even even places on our side of the bay you know growing up i know that you know my parents wouldn't want to make a trip to the malls because that was more than 20 minutes away and that's the kind of thing you would only do on the weekend right right it's, it's, tw I mean, it's 25 minutes forget about it we're not going to go anywhere right um so growing up uh, in new england um uh did uh, maybe speaking of rhode island was there anything about rhode island that what that might have um been beneficial to you as a used uh, aspiring musician i mean did you have access to things uh did you feel like you had access to musical uh not just study but just musical experiences yeah so um i uh was able to study with one of the professors at the university which was in the town where i was growing up mm-hmm um, that's not specific to Rhode Island, but it's, it was nice to be in a university town, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, I was, uh, at, 
when I was in ninth grade, I started violin, so I took part in youth orchestra, mm-hmm. um, which was in um, Providence or Warwick, really. But um, and I and I took part in all state. By the time I was a senior, I think being in a small state helped because I was, you know, I I started really violin really late. Mm-hmm. I was a pianist, right? But uh, I started violin late, and so. Um, I think if I were in a big state, I wouldn't have been able to do all state. <laughs> yeah, right. Because of the, 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 just the sheer numbers, right? Yeah. And also you kind of got, uh, you kind of got to know a lot of the, um, a lot of the folks your age that were interested in making music mm-hmm. um, statewide. So, you know, later on, if, if someone knew anyone from Rhode Island who was involved in music that was about my age, I would know them. Right, right. A very small family of, as, of kind musicians. Of, kind of neat. I suppose it's a little bit like that uh, if you were to compare Rhode Island to, like, I don't know, greater Dayton, Ohio, or something like that. You know, yeah, like, right, uh, right. Sort of a metro area, yeah. Right. Yeah. So, but anyway, yeah, I think there were some nice benefits. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How is, uh, it's interesting because this is some, something I didn't know that you, uh, um, violin is not an easy instrument to pick up, um, and picking it up kind of on, on the later side, how did, how did that, how, how, how was that for you physically in terms of making that, that move from an instrument that kind of is in front of you, like the piano to something that's kind of up here? Um, I don't know. I mean, I think I did okay with it. It was, I don't think it was a difficult transition necessarily. Not that it was a true transition because I continued studying piano, but sure. Um, but no, I, I, um, I don't, I don't think that, um, it, it was an issue. It was, sure. Um, all right. So here you are, a uh, um, a young lad in Rhode Island. Um, and you started writing your own pieces, you said, around 10, 11 years old? Right. Right. Well, what, so what gave you the, I guess, the inspiration to start writing your own music? I mean, was, was it just you, just, you just started thinking, hey, I, this, this, this melody is cool, or you just, I mean, how was, what was like kind of the impetus for that? Um, I don't know exactly, but like I said, I was interested in being creative. Mm-hmm. So. Um, it made sense um, starting out, getting into the performing of music that I would then find a creative aspect of what I was doing. Yeah, the, the yeah. Piano. I'm curious because you you uh, were were interested in the dramatic arts and stories, right? Making stories and things of this nature. That the translation, I think, in terms of the perhaps the imagination might not be as big of a shift as maybe some people might otherwise realize because in a way as a composer you're also telling stories but you're doing so in a kind of a non-verbal medium yeah and um i it's become more that way in recent years for me as i've been really exploring mm-hmm. narratology and and how to tell a story through music whereas um, my earliest works um, yes, I had an interest in um, telling stories or writing stories, but I, um, my earliest works for many years really were um, imitations of other music that I was learning or that I had just discovered, you know, so I, sure. my earliest works were imitations of Beethoven, maybe, and mm-hmm. um, I wrote a lot of pieces that were imitations of Chopin and... Uh, sure. Etc. Right. So um, it's really not until the last maybe ten years or so that I've um, I've found that I'm I'm actually kind of going back to the art of storytelling, um, kind of like when I was a kid. Yeah, interesting. Um, oft it, it it takes a while to learn to learn the craft, and uh, you point out something. So if those of those of you in the studio audience being their studio of, of your home uh, when you learn composition the uh, as you learn anything is that you go to works of the masters or those who are acknowledged to do it well 
<laughs> put it this way, right? People like Chopin. And you go, oh, okay, um, let's see what this person did and figure that out. Um, it's how Bach learned, actually. I mean, Bach copied Vivaldi scores by hand, you know, to kind of get, get that feeling, right? So, um, but what, what was the moment, if you have a moment, or maybe just the, the path that, uh, the spark, if you will, in you that said, hey, I want to be a composer, like, like, really do this. Mm -hmm. um, I knew by the time I graduated high school that I wanted to, to go um, into, I wanted to go to college and study music and math. So those are the two majors I, mm -hmm. I um, focused on in college. And um, I realized fairly early in my university experience that um, I didn't want to go into performance. I didn't want to continue on and get like a, a grad degree mm -hmm. in performance. I didn't didn't feel like I had the drive for that. Yeah. I didn't particularly like practicing that much. <laughs> <laughs> right. But I kept writing music. I was still interested in writing. And so, and then I, I was able to get... Um, even though I went to Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, and, and even though they didn't have a, um, they had never had an undergraduate composition major, mm. and they weren't hmm. able to offer that to me anyway, but they were able to find someone over at the Cleveland Institute who was a recent graduate of that program. Mm -hmm. and lessons, and her name was Jennifer Connor. Okay. And she... Um, started teaching me lessons uh, I think it was my sophomore year um, I had had a few lessons from various people in Rhode Island my senior year of high school but nothing was sustained mm -hmm. um, so and I you know overall I enjoyed it a lot more than piano lessons and practicing and stuff so <laughs> I, just, I just kept at it and um, yeah went and continued on because I, and upon graduation, basically by my senior year, I knew that I wanted to continue in composition. Mm -hmm. um, mathematics I had always enjoyed, but um, it gets pretty theoretical. The undergraduate degrees by the senior year, you're mm. doing complex analysis. And even by, certainly by sophomore year, and to some extent by freshman year, you're doing lots of proofs. Yeah, so, right. Uh, that didn't appeal to me as much as I had, I had thought it might. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I always enjoyed math and math in high school, but it gets more and more... More kind of, kinda, yeah, heady. Uh, yeah, I'm wondering, like, um, I, I think it's interesting. Uh, many composers have a science side game. Uh, um, not all, but many do. Uh, some interest in the sciences, be it um, mathematics or astronomy or physics or some combination of these things. Uh, and I find it interesting when I encounter um, fellow composers who also have this interest. I had similar interests in astronomy and meteorology, and for a while I wanted to be an astronomer. Uh, but unlike you, I I love the poetry of math, but I really wasn't ready to like do the math. And when you go into astronomy, Astronomy is really math. I mean, it's there's a lot of math. You got to know a lot of math. So, um, so it, I just didn't have the stomach for it. You went a little further than I did by actually, you know, majoring in it. I, I wasn't going to go there. But uh, um, what was? Did you find um, before maybe college? Did you find any synergy between mathematics and 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 music? Uh, were you aware, not just that music of the spheres stuff that people always throw around, but were you aware of, of sort of a deeper kind of underlying thing, at, or even personally, kind of that some, you know, uh, bridge? Yeah, um, I'm not sure how much thought I gave it, really, but um, I would say that kind of going back to what I was saying about how when I started writing music, I wasn't so much telling stories in music, I mean, maybe a little bit, mm -hmm. but I was really more capturing 
um, style, right? So I was mm -hmm. copying mm -hmm. sort of the Greeks, as you said. Um, and to capture style, you have to be able to perceive and then sort of replicate specific patterns mm -hmm. that, uh, mm -hmm. that are sort of the fingerprints of a particular style. And so I think one very important thing that mathematics and music have in common is pattern. Right? Yeah. So yeah. Um, sort of being able to identify and then construct patterns that make musical sense mm -hmm. um that has a connection to the ability to recognize and construct sort of in a mathematical way yeah so i think that that's part of part of the an important part of the connection between the two fields yeah yeah i mean it's more than just also the the <clears throat> kind of the set theory game that 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 you can get into and that sort of has a direct sort of overlay of math, right? Uh, but like you said, patterns are there. And I, I'm kind of curious, and we can touch on this later uh, when we share some of your music. And and I'm I'm interested also in, in how you are conceiving of musical form and gesture in terms of dramatic narrative or telling stories. I'm, I'm curious if... Um, you, you've seen a connection perhaps even to mathematics in drama or in a telling of a story. And, and I don't mean like in a kind of a surface way, but just something about math in terms of math's ability to describe mm -hmm. things or right. probabilities of, of events occurring and inevitability. I'm curious if you thought about that, or is that just something that 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 maybe you haven't crossed yet? Um, yeah, the two work kind of. A, so the telling of a story in music, and then the construction of patterns, or um, let's say uh, small and large scale formal devices, sometimes work at cross purposes. So, I, mm. I, so when an event happens in music that seems significant let's say from the narrative perspective it's sometimes it's it's because it's defied pattern so um hmm. i think that yes there are some there's a way in which you can kind of find mathematical aspects of let's say narrative structures mm -hmm. um, but i feel that they are more often than not very general where not very, not in a, not a very detailed, right, analytical way, like kind of like the the climax of a uh, a story, you mm -hmm. know, and often the climax of a musical work are sort of roughly two thirds of the way through, or right, the, the whole thing. golden mean and, thing. Yeah, that kind of thing you can identify, but um, down to sort of the um, building block level, I'm not sure how far down you go before you kind of just abandon <laughs> you run out of steam right yeah yeah all right so um after undergrad uh I, I think that's where we were leaving off you you pursued composition and you went on to where i went to yale for my master's mm -hmm. and uh who did you work with at yale i studied with ezra latterman oh yeah e evan zaporin Ned Roram and Martin Bresnik. Okay. So a different person every semester. I was there. Right, right. Uh, Yale encourages that. They encourage exploration. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And then your doctorate? My doctorate I got at Duke University. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but before I went to Duke, I lived in New York for two years. And what did you do? I did, I had two jobs. The first was um, in a tiny office of a software reselling company. Okay. And then, um, but that was for like a year. And then the next two years I worked as an actuary down at World Trade. Fascinating. So what was your, was that just because you wanted to take some time off? Uh, you just like, you didn't want to deal with the, the head game of sort of graduate study and you just needed some space. So you decided to be something else for a while? Um, so a couple things. One is I thought, I, I, I knew pretty for sure that I, I wanted to continue 
in music composition as a grad student. But um, I also thought if I was going to be in academia for the rest of my life, maybe I should take a break and, and not do it for a few years. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I also had not had the chance to live in New York, and I wanted to do that. So mm. I just yeah. I just went to New York and looked for a job and, and just did it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think there's some value, and maybe maybe this is you could say this as well that there is some value uh, for anyone who is at the graduate level to take some time off. Um, especially if not between the undergrad and grad level between the master's and doctoral level um just to kind of sometimes if you go all the way through that's great but there is you it it can be a little isolating in some ways and to kind of see other things and meet other people and do other things is i think a valuable experience and something that i've i've mentioned to uh, some students of mine who have gone on to 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 do these sort of things. Um, so I mean, for you, this that was a was it a valuable kind of reset for you, and you went back to sort of your PhD or doctoral program with with like a renewed focus. Uh, I think so. Yeah, I think it helped. On the other hand, um, when I was in New York, I didn't, I wasn't. Um, you know, some composers go to New York to kind of pound the pavement and, and really and do hustle. Like, do, yeah, do the music thing kind of yeah. as much as they possibly can. Mm -hmm. that wasn't really what I was there for. I mean, I yeah, I just hadn't lived in a big city. I mean, I lived in Cleveland, but it was I you know, lived on the east side of Cleveland. I mean, I don't know. It's not the same thing as living. <laughs> <laughs> We're living in Manhattan, right? Yeah. Absolutely. So um, I never did live in in Manhattan, but um, because it was so expensive, but I lived in. I lived in Brooklyn, Queens. I lived in Jersey City one summer. Um, but I, uh, no, I, I think um, the drawback was that I, I, ha I wasn't like 100% focused on the music scene. So there was a kind of a, um, a break between um, sort of, it, it was really like a break. Like it, it was a, yeah. kind of a loss of focus on music. Mm -hmm. Did, did, did you do much writing or did you try to, to yeah, do I did some? some? Yeah, I wrote some music. Um, I wrote um, a cello solo. I think I wrote for a few things that were kind of like for competitions. I was like, well, I'll just write something and mm -hmm. you know, send it away. Mm -hmm. um, I wrote some short piano pieces. I wrote a percussion quartet for a percussion quartet that wanted music. Um, mm. Things like that. I didn't write that much, though. Okay. Uh, yeah. Some. Yeah. Uh, was it was that because you were just busy with your day job and trying to just make things work in New York? Yeah. More. Yeah. Right. I mean, I just was I, I had a full time job. And, um, I, I, I think that actually being an actuary, one of the benef beneficial things about being an actuary is you do get time off to study. But I did all my studying on my commute. So when I got time off to study, I would yeah so that was kind of helpful yeah yeah um so then you moved to north carolina right and um so that that was a shift <laughs> from manhattan <laughs> right yeah. it was nice though it's a, it's right a nice area. um it's uh it's also very different the program at duke is quite different from the program at yale and that the one at yale is a school of music so you're surrounded by lots of performers yeah and um, it's actually so at Duke there are of course other grad students in music, but there are mm -hmm. all founders basically and composers. Right. So, right. Um, but um, but I I had a, a good time there, and um, mm -hmm. uh, I would say um, actually it, yeah in at Duke it was a, a little it was more academic than Yale, so I mean if you were to say if I, if I said I studied music at Yale, someone might think, oh, well, it must have been, uh, you know, a challenging academic program there or something like that. But that's actually not not, not the case. case. The emphasis there really is on making making music. And, yeah. And the classwork that I did, the courses that I took were not particularly challenging academically at, at Duke. It was 
more more challenging, I would say. Yeah, there is uh, a di that distinction at Yale, as uh, some people may not know this, but at Yale there's a distinction between the Department of Music and the School of Music. Um, at least there was. I don't know if that's changed since I, I remember. It's still, it's still the case. And in the department, you have the musicologists and the theorists, but the composers are in the School of Music, the applied area. Um, and so, so in the Department of Music, it is a bit more academic-focused um, for, for, those, for those reasons. Although you, you can take classes you know, across... You know, it's, it's, they're not separated so completely, but there are two different different units. Mm -hmm. um, so, after you received your doctorate, uh, what what happened next? Um. Well, let's see. So I, I mean, I was um, on campus until after the first. Uh, three or four years maybe and then i was basically dissert dissertating so um mm -hmm. i was in different places um my wife got a job in california one semester and then and she got a job a tenure no uh, a one-year position in wisconsin so we were there for a year and then mm -hmm. she got her current job in iowa and so and that was in 2008 and then the following year is when i got my job in illinois right right this was uh uh her uh, the college in iowa is, is grinnell right yes it's grinnell right um so the uh i met you in was it 2011 maybe i can't remember now it was yeah, <laughs> I do remember. So a funny story is uh, when I first met Carl, um, Carl, one of Carl's responsibilities was driving me around the, the town of Bloomington Normal, the whole, the Metroplex of Bloomington. <laughs> and so, and, uh, and I'll never forget this. This is like, this is like, I, there are many things that stuck in my head, but one of the things that stuck in my head is Carl, Carl goes, and and if you don't know, if you don't know Carl, he's a pretty quiet guy, but he's really very funny, dry sense of humor that comes out in these interesting ways. And um, Carl goes, "Well, you know, we have the world's largest Dairy Queen," <laughs> or so, it was something to that effect. Do you remember that? <laughs> I don't remember, but it, I think we so we do have the, the first Steak and Shake. Maybe that's what I was talking about. I don't know. Yeah, and and it was like. <laughs> out of nowhere i just remember like every time anybody goes goes there i always say well you got to have carl take you to like the world's largest dairy queen or whatever it was or steak and, the, the first steak and shake or something um and those of you who have not been out to the midwest and don't know what a steak and shake is um it's literally what its name is it's fries burgers and and milkshakes and pretty good too i mean if you're into yeah if you're into that sort of thing um so about your musical journey uh through so ac academics aside um was there a point and this question had been asked last week uh so i'll go ahead and preemptively ask this question if this question decide comes up and by the way uh for those of you at home uh carl has a different view of me by the way uh, he has a different camera view, but for those of you at home, whenever I look off to the side here, I'm looking at the other monitor where I can actually see the chat window. Um, so uh, I'm not taking chat questions right now, but I, I, I can see that. Uh, can Carl be a little louder? Uh, Emily Co, by the way, is has, is on board here. I am trying to boost Carl's uh, um, signal. Where I'm watching the the little level levels go up and down. Uh, so I'll, I'll keep monitoring that. Um, so don't if I if I look this way, those of you at home, I'm not looking away because I'm bored. I'm actually looking either at the chat window or at the music. Um, so one of the questions was like, when did you did you know if you ever did that you felt like maybe you 
didn't necessarily need guided instruction in composition or in music. Like, and I think if I could rephrase that, we all we we all are we're all lifelong learners. We're all studying and learning. And I think there's at some point that when you get to a certain point, you, you, your your capacity for self study and self growth kind of outweighs the capacity of having perhaps maybe taking a class specifically in music or having a composition lesson with a mentor. Not saying that those things aren't valuable later in life and they, they wouldn't serve a purpose by having a lesson with somebody that you respect, but was was there a point at which you felt um, that you had what you, you, you got what you wanted out of say at school, out of structured education? Um, I don't know if there was a point at which I thought, you know what, I don't need any lessons anymore. <laughs> I don't know if I think, think that exact thing, but um, I, I guess I would say that, I mean, in the same way that, you know, when you're learning to ride a bike, you kind of need someone there to help you for a while until you mm. go and get the hang of it on your own. Mm -hmm. So hopefully I've gotten the hang of it on my own by now. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I, 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 I do think uh, really in teaching composition is such a funny thing. Like, mm. um, I mean, a true real expert pedagogue would probably have lots of um, lots of tools at their disposal. But I think most of us, when we teach composition, we're really just coming at some music that's just been written mm -hmm. from our, and then commenting on that music from our own perspective. So mm -hmm. our, our own perspective is just one perspective. I think that it's helpful if we can draw on, you know, like just, just focus on sort of the facts of the situation and, right. and, and, um, and make references to existing works of music and, mm -hmm. and help, help to draw those kinds of parallels. But at the end of the day, if, if a student, um, is already set on doing a certain thing, they're, they're just going to go ahead and, and they're just going to do it anyways. I mean, they'll, they'll nod their head when you give them whatever advice yeah, you have exactly. and come back and the next the week. Way, I think we're all to some extent. Right. That, I suppose. Right. Maybe, maybe not Brooklyn. Right. <laughs> right. But yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and also, I mean, the, <clears throat> it's the sort of another interesting aspect of being a composer and maybe teaching composing is that, it's the sort of breaking of um, what is expected or what is typical or what is maybe the quote unquote rule. Yeah, that's right. That's what makes your identity in some ways. So it's sort of like, you know, you're develop, if you develop a style or you develop a compositional or musical identity, it might have everything to do with how you break the rules or do the wrong thing. Right, right, so, yeah. Um, once a student has found his or her way of breaking the rules in the right way mm -hmm. then yeah it's on the right path yeah yeah there's something to be said for um getting to a point where you as an artist um can um defend might not be the right word but it often is framed as a defense of your your choices that you can you can defend your choices uh, with conviction, and so I find, and I, I I tell this to students all the time. I say, you know, if you come in with an idea, and I pr propose some suggestions, whatever, and you say no, and and that is coming from a place of absolute and deep conviction that this is absolutely necessary for that person, for that individual, then my job is done. I'm like, yeah, absolutely. You've def you know, you, this is what you want to say. Um, and I, and I, I think that's really the process of teaching composition in a sense. Um, I mean, maybe you have more to say about that, but people, often ask, well, you know, what is it like to teach composition? And I say, well, we really don't teach composition. I mean, that's not a 
kind of a teachable skill. We can teach all the craft elements and we can teach, you know, literature and we can provide reflection as a listener, as a critical listener. But ultimately, it's that interior process that a student goes through in terms of processing that information and having that own critical gut check. Mm. And when that critical gut check comes out and says, you know, this is this is absolutely what I want to say and how I want to say it, then I think that's the moment that that um, kind of bring this around. That might be the moment when when maybe the student doesn't need any more uh, lessons or something like this, right? Mm -hmm. It's sort of like, okay, you, you, you now know what you want to say. Now that might change next week, next year, and it definitely will, but you, you're on the right path, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and I think the other thing is, and I, I think I'll, I'll circle this back around to, 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 to you and how your development, um, you feel that teaching composition has um, informed your own musical voice, not not directly from like say a student brings an idea and you say, "Oh, this is a great idea. I'm going to steal it," but just the process. Yeah, uh, to some extent. Yeah, I mean, it helps. It's helped me actually just um, focus my aesthetic positions a little bit. Mm because I can, I mean, articulate them a little bit better than I used to be able to. Right. Uh, and try to put those forth as arguments for or against something that a student is doing. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Um, I think actually teaching theory has, has also helped me because, uh, you know, you really don't, there's no better way to learn than to teach really so yeah right um and spending extra time with you know the music of beethoven and bach and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a good a good way to to um right continue to kind of engage with the tradition yeah and get paid for it and get paid for it <laughs> right <laughs> you know it's it's one of those things where i pinch myself sometimes where i'm realizing like oh wow i i i I'm actually getting paid to look at Shostakovich. This is pretty cool. Right. <laughs> like, you know, even though I have to explain it and I have to do a lesson plan or do whatever, you know, but nonetheless, you know, all the first world grumblings of your, you know, aside, there's right. that element of like, wow, I get to work with the literature and I get to basically choose what I want to do almost, right? I get to choose how I want to do it as a teacher. Um, so, like many composers, so you mentioned theory, and sometimes theory can be used as a four-letter word in composition, but um, I also teach theory too, so, and I'm kind of a theory nerd, so, um, but, uh, so your, your teaching at ISU is, how much of it is, is it split between, say, theory and, and composition? Uh... I would say, well, in in terms of contact time, it might be about equal. As far as the workload goes, it's probably more on the theory side because I have grading to do and right. class prep, which doesn't really come into play for composition lessons. Mm -hmm. um, right. So. Um, yeah, we all have to do those things as our, you know, ways of putting food on the table. And like you said, learn too at the same time, right? Learn, learn in the experience. Um, so coming back to composition, uh, and then I want to listen to some music. Um, do you have a piece that you wrote in your past that you felt was a piece that was really yours? So speaking of that, of that moment of like really defending, say your conviction. I mean, a piece that, that, that you, you might not be there now, obviously musically, but a piece that you felt like, Oh, this is, this is Carl Schimmel. This is, this is me, not me lensing Chopin. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, I don't know if it would be if there was one piece in particular that stood out, but it's uh, the kind of process that takes place over time. 
that um, overall my pieces become more and more shimmel. <laughs> Shimmelizing right. the music, right? Yeah. Right. So there are some that come to mind as being like in the direction of my current aesthetic. Yeah. Uh, and in particular, the pieces that I wrote in graduate school, both at Yale, but especially, well, I think especially at Duke, but it, in, at Yale and at Duke that had elements of humor, I think. Mm hmm. Those are the pieces that um, maybe were indications of where I was going to end up later. Mm -hmm. So and that's a good that's a good point. Um, so I know that humor plays a, a role in your music, um, and um, did you find it difficult to at first to incorporate? say your sense of humor into the music and make it something that is about what you want wanted to be about i mean it when people think of humor in music you know they think of sort of like slapstick music right so i mean humor and irony can be expressed in music in many many different kinds of ways so um can can you tell us a little bit about that journey towards how you began to incorporate elements of humor and I guess in some ways connected back to the drama element, right? Cause humor, hum comedy is drama. Yeah. Uh, right. So there, there's, there are some ways in which I first started um, exploring you know, contrast in music that, that was, sudden or exaggerated enough that it was almost comical mm -hmm. I think um, but uh, explicitly humorous music I didn't really start to do probably until I was a grad student at Duke um, I was um, I mean the pieces that come to mind are the ones where I have several pieces which use squeaky toys so there are, there are three that come to mind from when I was at Duke uh, that I very obviously was going for something ridiculous. Right, right. Yeah. So before that, it was more like, um, you know, uh, uh, I suppose there might, might have been elements of like Haydn-esque wit or something, or like mm -hmm. kind of dark humor or something. Mm -hmm. um, like the juxtaposition, of strange juxtapositions or something like that. But really, it wasn't until I was at Duke that I started doing the absurd stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Which I don't very much anymore, although I do some of. Um, right. One of my most recent pieces does have kind of a very goofy aspect to it, but I would say it's really at Duke where I did a whole bunch of kind of goofy pieces. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, well, why don't we listen to some music? Uh, we have queued up uh, the second movement of your chamber symphony. And uh, I'm going to pull the score up for the listeners at home. Um, and do you want to tell us anything about this piece or just let it happen and then maybe talk about it later? And I will also, for those at home who are watching and listening, we'll have some space for some questions too for Carl about anything. Um, so. I don't know, Carl, do you want to say anything about this this second movement from your chamber symphony? Um, sure. So, well, so um, what the performance you'll hear is a live performance and, um, by Alarm Will Sound. Mm -hmm. And um, this second movement does, it is of the four movements in my chamber symphony, it's sort of the humorous one. Um, I mean, it's not necessarily hysterically funny, but there are humorous elements in it. Um, it's the chamber symphony is sort of based on Gravity's Rainbow, which is novel by Thomas Pynchon. Uh, it, it, the novel is in four large parts, so each of my four movements is is based on one of the large parts of the of the novel. Mm -hmm. um, this second part of the novel is, I think, the one that has the most kind of ridiculous stuff going on in it 
um, the way I constructed the symphony was I, I did an analysis of all the small sections of the novel and uh, determined which characters were in which of those small sections. And then I, the result was a kind of a form where mm. musical ideas are um, correspond to specific characters. And the novel has like a hundred major characters. It's yeah. like kind of ridiculous how many characters there are. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, uh, and so for this second section, when I did the sort of breakdown of how characters entered and left the scene, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, there was a kind of pattern, at least for the first part of the large section. So, um, so what I found was that there was a kind of, it corresponded roughly to a variation form. Okay. What you'll hear is a variation form that sort of falls apart. Okay. So there's a kind of a breakdown in the variation form. Um, so all of that is to say that listeners um, might be able to detect this um, this kind of variation form that falls apart. Uh, and we can talk more about the novel st and, and stuff later if you want. Sure. Great. All right. Well, um, let us cue up this piece. Uh, the score is now in front and we will rejoin after the music. Thank you. 
Wow, that was great. Um, I hadn't heard that before uh, today when Carl sent that to me, and I'm going to switch so we can see each other and the music at the same time. Um, when did you write this, Carl? Uh, 2014. Okay. <laughs> uh, the kazoo came in. <laughs> that was a... Yeah. There's kazoos in, mostly in this movement, but in various parts of the piece. Uh, and I did that because in the novel they keep coming up. Kazoos enter into various scenes in the, in the novel. It's really... The Pynchon has a kind of strange, um, humorous, absurd quality, you know, so mm -hmm. um, I, thought, I, I wanted to include that because of stuff. Um, very colorful and um, very well orchestrated as, as, as I, I know your music to be. Um, what, I mean, reflecting on this piece now, um, how how does this fit into your concept of telling a story? I mean, obviously you are telling a story. I mean, you're using a story material, but uh, is this where on that scale of your journey does this piece fit in terms of your becoming more, let's say, grounded in the notion of telling a story through music? Well, so um, the idea behind this piece wasn't so much to tell the story of Gravity's Rainbow, but to, to kind of extract its form mm -hmm. and use the form of Gravity's Rainbow as determined by the character, the con basically the interaction of characters, mm -hmm. um, and then use that form to construct a piece of music, which may have some, but at the same time, of course, it has some things um, in common at least I was trying to have it have things in common with Gravity's Rainbow from a some, somewhat aesthetic point of view in that there's a kind of, it has um, parts of the Chamber Symphony are very dark, mm -hmm. parts of them are comedic like aspects of this movement. Right, right. Um, so, and that's something that I think um, definitely Gravity's Rainbow has. Um, so I tried to kind of capture some aspects of that novel, but the main thing that, that was the main connection, the main thing driving the construction of this particular piece was the, um, the form, the formal aspect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so um, what results, I think, is music that seems to be telling a story because there, it's very, especially because it's so, like you say, colorful and like exaggerated. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, and yet we don't necessarily know what that story might be. Exactly. Yeah. That's kind, of, that's kind of the case with just about any music that, right. uh, that has a narrative quality, um, unless there's some kind of titles, you know, um, some, or some vocals, you know, lyrics, then you really don't know exactly what it's about. Right, right. Um, I, I, I have a kind of a follow up to that qu question because I, I myself also am wrestling with the concept of narrative non non narrative narrative um is there anything uh, kind of specific in in this movement that maybe you could illuminate uh some of those character char the connection of musical gesture to character that perhaps the our listeners would be interested in maybe seeing i have the score projected in in front of me if if you uh not to put you on the spot. <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, there are a few I could point out. Um, one of the characters who is important in this part of the novel is Katya. And mm -hmm. her, the basic musical motive that I've given to her is um, most clearly evident in this movement, actually toward the end of the movement, even though it does show up quite frequently in the first half. If you look at... Um, place yeah like uh, variation eight um has this it's basically triads that um like descending major descending minor descending um basically like a fourth and stuff and then it goes up 
um that's one of her themes uh -huh. um the kind of the the most evil character in the novel has his own theme and it's the kind of um uh kind of speaking through the trombone kind of um mm. motive which does happen toward the end of the movement um kind of on on um i don't know what, which which version you you have i can't recall but <laughs> <laughs> maybe 209 or 210 like there's some okay speaking through the trombone yeah yeah, yeah so. i can i can see uh so the the folks at home uh I don't know if you can see where my mouse pointer is. Uh, if 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 we if this was a Zoom session, I'd pull up the annotation tools, uh, but I'm circling with my mouse over some of that in the trombone part. Um, and there's a yeah. kind of an interruption that takes place. Part of the falling apart of the variation. Form. Yeah. Interruption that takes place at, at what is labeled variation four, and the kind of first really loud moment in that variation is there's a, a theme associated with mm. um, another kind of evil character <laughs> and and that's an interruption of sorts that it would it would make more sense if you could have heard the first movement too because it's a reference to something that happens in yeah the so that's the kind of thing that um happens throughout this symphony um and um you know that's an aspect of the novel obviously mm. you, you don't hear anything about a character for you know 100 pages or so and then and then they re-enter you know so, yeah uh, that's kind of one of the interesting aspects of using a form like this mm -hmm. um let's see if we I, I know we have another another piece queued up if we have time uh but uh i'm going to take a look at the uh chat uh window here and see if we have any uh, questions from our uh, studio audience. Um, I, I don't know uh, if we do. Uh, if anybody uh, would like to ask Carl any questions, uh, there's about a 15 second lag uh, between um, when we're doing our thing and when they respond. So we'll, I'll keep checking. Um, was there any any particular reason why you chose this piece to show tonight? Um, was it was it because of the of these elements that you were just talking about and your interest in their in narrative structure? Uh, that I mean maybe that's part of it, but the main reason I guess is because I am pleased with how it turned out. I mean I think it's um, it has an elements of humor, which is you know humor is kind of an important aspect of my style mm -hmm. um, and i think i was pleased with sort of all the um some of the orchestration decisions like how they turned out um the performance is great yeah it really is yeah it's a, it's, it's a fab it's a fabulous performance yeah so i just um like it for a variety of reasons mm -hmm. um, i think it has a a strong kind of personality which is nice um, yeah not, not every piece we write is has that um you know sometimes i write a piece and then like i'm not always so sure if if, if, <laughs> if what i thought it would be you know when you start you know, but this one turned out well i thought yeah yeah it's it's a it's i i didn't know the piece i listened to little bits of it before um coming on and um just to check levels and check and i've listened to some of the other movements too just to get and uh it's a very colorful and as you said very well performed piece uh and very um, um it it sounds like you had fun writing it yeah you can feel i can feel the fact that you were having fun with the with the piece yeah and one of the things about um I mean, I don't, I don't always write music necessarily for the, for other people to hear. It's, it's. I mean, I think what drew me to composition is the, is the kind of playing with notes and, and the construction aspect of it, which you can probably kind of, maybe have guessed, based on what I was saying about how I built this symphony. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like I, yeah. I took a, an idea that, was 
not by any means guaranteed to work even. <laughs> I mean I mean to take this ridiculously long novel that a lot of people just give up on in the middle <laughs> because it's so it's so kind of mm -hmm. um, it's a it's a kind of a difficult and yeah very uh, um tortuous kind of thing. <laughs> torturous and tortuous i guess right so um and then to, to put that into music is kind of mm. kind of almost a ridiculous idea even to do that but, yeah but i yeah. i did but I you didn't. you did it you yeah yeah um so i think maybe uh maybe for contrast uh, uh before we uh wrap things up um you have another piece, um, a more recent piece, um, that you um, wanted to share with us. Do you want to tell us anything about this um, this piece? I think uh, the first movement. Am I correct? Yeah. Um, so, you know, one reason I I thought we could take a listen to this is that, it, for one thing, it's more recent. It's mm -hmm. 2018, but. Also, it's more of a contrast um, to this movement we just heard. The mu music you're about, to, you're about to hear is is much more kind of romantic in style. Um, several of my recent works are are, are kind of exploring that. Um, mm -hmm. In this case, it's about um, this is based on a folk tale or fairy tale from Russia, a famous one called Vasilisa the Beautiful. Mm. And it's a lot like a Cinderella story, except in the end of Vasilisa the Beautiful, um, the stepsisters and the mother are destroyed by fire by this magical skull. <laughs> so, not a happy ending. Uh, not really. But then in some <laughs> versions of it, she goes on and marries the Tsar. So that's the happy ending. Part. Okay, all right. But that's kind of an optional part, because the big finish, really, I think, is the destruction by fire of the stepsisters and stepmother by the magical skull really I mean, right so, that's the cool the cool part of it the, the barn burner part um, <laughs> yeah. so uh but actually the section that you're going to hear is in two sections i wrote the piece in two sections the first is really about more like an introduction hmm. um it sets the stage because um you know just as in cinderella you know her mother dies so she's she's left hmm. with her father but um, in in this um, in this story from Russia, mm -hmm. her mother is dying, and she leaves her this magical doll, and the magical doll is the one who ends up kind of saving her for the, from, for the rest of the story. Yeah. But um, so there's a kind of a I basically am telling the story, mm -hmm. um, especially in the second part, which you're not going to hear. But um, I try to parallel the events of the story musically. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And in the second part, you know, you can actually hear like things happening in groups of three, the way they often do in fairy tales. Right, um, in right. This, in this first movement, it's more about capturing kind of an atmosphere. And there is um, a kind of a middle section in which um, the magical doll theme is, is um, presented. So there's a kind of a contrasting middle section. And that the climax of the movement toward the end um, is her um, grief at the death of her mother. So th there's mm -hmm. kind of, um, mm -hmm. uh, kind of a, hopefully listeners can kind of follow those moments. Yeah. Um, and in this movement, I also sort of was drawing on, and I continue to this day to do this. I, I often will take music by other people to construct my music. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so for example, in this piece, um, the, one of the main characters in the story is Baba Yaga. Uh -huh. And of course, um, Lou Zorksky has a, uh, a movement from his pictures at an exhibition that is about Baba Yaga. So I, I make like subtle references to that. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, um, I'm using, there's an explicit quote in this of a piece by Dufay um, called Vasilisa Ergo Gaude. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Um, I made, I thought, oh, well, I'll have to quote this. And anyway, it's a, a beautiful little melody so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah um, so why not <laughs> there's a moment there's a moment in the in this first movement where um you know listeners might be able to detect a kind of change of style like it has a kind of a um almost chorale like um feel and that's the quote the dufai quote mm -hmm. 
Um, but, you know, and then I generate other materials from it. Sure, so. sure. Great. Awesome. Well, let's uh, let's give this a listen to and uh, and then we'll come back for some uh, last time with Carl. So uh, we'll cue this up now.
Wow, that was beautiful, Carl. That was really beautiful. Um, I, I know you, you might have mentioned this. Uh, what year did you... What year did you write this? Uh, 2018. 2018, okay. Yeah, that was the Clarosa Quartet. Okay. And that's a, that was a live performance at the Kingston Chamber Music Festival. Wow. Uh, well, it's a... Well, I, 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 okay, so maybe I don't know enough about your latest music. I mean, I know your transient canvas piece and some other things that, that I've heard, but this is this is definitely, I think you mentioned, very romantic. Um, I mean, which is an interesting term to use because that, that carries a lot of different kinds of connotation, right? <laughs> yeah. um, what what does romantic actually really mean, right? Um, but it's very, very direct, Mm -hmm. you know it's like you're not you know i feel like in this music here you're 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 not leaving a lot to the imagination in the sense and in a good way like you're just saying okay this is this is it it's right right here right mm -hmm. this is I'm, I'm just saying it um and beautiful har harmonies nice moves really gorgeous choices uh nice um, orchestrations impeccable um so is this uh without getting too uh simplistic is this um sort of indicative of 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 your current style or sort of incorporating more of these kinds of gestures into your music or have you always been been doing this just sort of maybe more in the background yeah i think the latter actually i mean i've always been um a big fan of romantic era music mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. early 20th century but also late romantic music so um i think that a lot of the kind of exaggerated gestures in my music are simply uh they they derive from the kinds of gestures that show up in strauss you know and stuff yeah like yeah yeah um, right they're just a little bit more humorous in some cases but of course in this movement that's there's no humor in this movement as far as i know anyway mm -hmm. it's just, um it's just the it's it, there's just a lot of that romantic kind of um style in a way there's like uh full chords you know very expressive um kind of wide leaps in the melody right um, right melodic, lyrical and melodic right um, yeah so yeah uh really beautiful um but of course it it and now sort of connecting this back to narrative i mean it is you know knowing the story um and and sort of knowing sort of how the story may end uh or variations of it and sort of knowing the 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 uh, knowing this it 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 makes total sense like you you've you've set the stage very beautifully for for the for the story right um and so in some ways as a as a composer how much of when you're trying to 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 let's say tell a story in music and maybe a, a story very specifically a very specific story maybe without the lyrics as you mentioned before or any kind of specific programmatic dramatic staging or whatever um how what what do you feel your role is in terms of doing uh, the story, the stories, doing service to the story, or how free do you feel you are in terms of your expressive palette to interpret? Right. Uh, that probably uh, depends a lot on the story, right? So, sure. Yeah. This is a, a very old folk tale, fairy tale that's been told in many different ways for you know, hundreds of years. I mm -hmm. So I feel like I have a lot of leeway with this. Yeah. If it's a, let's say it's a, um, if it's a, a work by a living author, and especially if it's supposed to be, if it's about, let's say a true story, mm -hmm. that deep significance for people who are still alive today. I mean, that would be a totally different story. Right. So, and I have never, I don't think written, um music that is 
telling a story like that, mm-hmm. if I recall correctly. Mm. Um, you know, so, uh, but I think that I probably would approach things a little differently if I were to do that. Sure. Like to do something like John Adams has done in his Oscars, for example. Right, right. Something with, with a real historical immediacy con- or contemporary or something very contemporaneous. Yeah. Um, I think I picked up the Dufay. Uh, was it, uh, where was this? In the impassioned part? It could be. I don't have the score. In oh. The <laughs> <laughs> there, well, there you go. <laughs> Just. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so. Because um, I know you mentioned, you mentioned beforehand the. Um, that it was in a corral. I mean, I could hear the corral uh, come in. Yeah, um, beautiful work. Uh, let's see if we have any any questions uh, for you. Um, I'll switch back views here. Uh, I don't have a producer, and so because I don't have a producer, uh, I have to do all of these transitions myself. <laughs> So, and I also have to answer the questions myself. I, I, I don't have a, uh, somebody taking phone calls. Um, uh, we do have a comment, very nice piece. I think uh, Nathaniel Akers uh, is one, one of my former students. Um, uh, I'm assuming that's probably in relation to the piece we just heard. Um, um, do we have any uh, other questions? I mean, Carl and I will talk for a little bit longer. I don't want to keep him too much later. I think we'll try to wrap this up right around 9 o'clock. Um, but if you have any questions uh, for Carl about his music or anything, really, um, feel free to, to type it in. Um, I'll monitor the, the chat window here um, and hopefully look like I'm not being too distracted as I look off to the side. In, in this... I'm learning how to do this. I think I mentioned this on the pre-game, the pre-ch- pre-chat game, is that I'm figuring out kind of how to use the software and kind of what's going to work the best in the future. So thank you for being um, guest number two, where everything may not be working very perfectly. I, I told I told uh, Tony last week. Um, uh, do you know Tony Landman? Yeah. yeah, you did the yeah. Uh, so Tony, uh, I told Tony, I said I'll have you back on whenever I've got everything worked out, <laughs> so so it'll look a lot better and sound better, you know. Um, well, I wanted to talk about something like, uh, what are you working on now? What's your current project or uh, projects? You know, just in the last few days, I sent off um, some intermediate piano pieces for the uh, that were commissioned by the Iowa Music Educators. Or music teachers association mm-hmm. uh, so i just finished that um i i've been off and on at work on my third string quartet um which <laughs> well it, it was going to be uh performed in new york in the fall but i i hadn't really finished it in time for that to happen um so we rescheduled it this is for momenta quartet Mm-hmm. We scheduled it for this spring, but as you can imagine, that will not be happening. <laughs> right, and many things so, have been, um, right. Yeah, so I don't know when it will happen, but in any case, um, because the performance date has been moved, I keep shifting gears to other pieces that are more pressing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. so now I'll probably Makes turn sense. back to the quartet. Mm-hmm. Get that wrapped up hopefully soon. I was going to write some pieces for Justin Vickers, who's um, the tenor faculty at Illinois State. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I'm trying to think if I'm forgetting anybody. But I think I, I think I don't have big a big project lined up for for the fall yet. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's it's interesting. Have you found? Uh, I mean. Obviously, it's it, it's kind of difficult to not talk about our current weird situation here, uh, unprecedented situation, uh, all being sequestered at home and uh, having, in some ways, more time. I found personally, although I've thrown the f- more 
balls up in the air to catch, like doing this show, for example, and, and other things. Uh, I found that I actually don't have as much time as I thought I would have, given the fact that I can just be home all the time, uh, including teaching. <laughs> so, you know, the time I, I thought I'd have for composing is is actually not quite as much as, as, as I <laughs> would otherwise have guessed. If you had told me two months ago, oh, you're going to be home for the rest of the semester, I'd be like, great, I can finish, I can finish that solo violin piece that I've been sitting on my desk. So how has that been working out for you? Have you been able to carve out more composing time or has it been a mixed bag? Not really, no. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I funny. actually save, I probably have saved more time with this situation than a lot of people because I have, I live four hours away from where I work. So yeah, I have an eight hour commute every week, basically. I have to drive four hours on Sunday night and four hours on Thursday. Yeah. And so I immediately get an entire work day. Yeah. Staying home, right. Basically. So right. I should theoretically have a lot more time. I think, All day. I think, I, I think if I were more focused on making sure that I kept a schedule yeah. and um, refused to see my kids during the work. <laughs> Daddy's at work. Yeah. You're right. Um, no lunch today. You're just on your own. Yeah, that's right. You know how to make a sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, I would have more time for composing. <laughs> right. But... Um, no, I, uh, but yeah, no, I, I probably could if I, if I were really strict about the schedule and mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. my wife and I had planned everything out so that only one of us had to kind of make sure the kids were not electrocuting. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, right. We have kind of a loose schedule. So, um, time is easily lost in the gaps. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, that's interesting. Um, uh, time is i mean even though the the I, my classes still convene on zoom so i still have my schedule okay. um uh, i don't know what it is how how I, isu is handling it but um i still do synchronous teaching on monday wednesday friday it's working out surprisingly well actually uh al almost to the extent where, where you know i I don't want to make the argument to do this, but you could make the argument is, well, I probably could just do all this from home. Why do I have to go? I don't even need to go home. I don't need to go to the office. So, yeah, we're, we're doing, uh, each professor is kind of, in, has, um, is able to kind of decide for him or herself what's appropriate. I had read in making decisions about what to do with my classes. I had read various kind of experts or whatever say that, Asynchronous is a better way to go for mm -hmm. many students in a situation like this because they might have to go back to work at things. You know, sure. Like these situations like and stuff. So I I'm doing asynchronous, but um, I th and I think really what is lost the main thing that's really lost there is the sort of interaction. Yeah. So yeah. I I would say that definitely like in person is better, or in any case synchronous is better. Yeah. But, um, but uh, things are kind of working out, I guess. Hopefully, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, it's all uncharted territory. I, I, I like you have also, also, before we started up, I also was reading similar articles about the pluses and minuses of synchronous versus asynchronous. Uh, and uh, one of the, the decisions that I made, and, and it was more or less not mandated by the school, but it was kind of suggested by the school that synchronous synchronous would be potentially better in some ways um, was, was a kind of a grounding for the students uh, in a sense, like to get back to something that's normal in a situation that's completely not normal, um, provide them that. And so I kind of felt like maybe that was, that would be a good thing. And so I even like, like, so my usual garb is like a sport coat and like a, in the winter time, a scarf like I'm wearing now. So like even the first day of teaching on Zoom, I dressed like I would if I was in the classroom and, and I had my cup of coffee and I tried to say, hey, you know, this is really weird for everybody, but we're still going to learn the minor mode now. <laughs> and, and I'm still going to make bad jokes. And... Oh, What's that? How appropriate to be 
Right. About the minor <laughs> right. Exactly. Right. Right. Well, you know, there's harmonic and melodic and well, mode, other modes too. <laughs> so anyway, um, we have a comment from Tyler, uh, and Telesano, who is a composer, uh, who actually, uh, uh, he was in Alba. Yeah. Yeah. Remember you remember Tyler. Uh, he said, uh, listening, listening to this has been lovely. Thank you both for doing this. And I want to say, I enjoy both of your work. Thank you for this. Uh, so that's, Thanks, thank you. Thank, thank you. Um, well, I, uh, I think it's about that hour here. It's nine o'clock. And uh, Carl, this has been wonderful to spend uh, the last 90 minutes with you um, and, uh, and get a chance to share a little bit of music. And uh, we'll have this uh, up on the YouTube channel and on the Facebook page. So anybody who uh, missed it uh, can play it anytime they want. And uh, I, I will get better. So at some point, I'll have you back on whenever I've got real production and maybe even a producer running things in the background. It'll, it'll be like a real thing, you know, uh, an, actual an actual studio. Right, exactly. Probably still in the house, too. Um, but anyway, Carl, thank you so, so, so much. Um, and, um, uh, you know, please stay safe, stay healthy, um, you know, and uh, hopefully things will get back to some sense of normalcy for all of us pretty soon so thank you, right. so, much, thank you so much and for next week uh we're going to have a friend of mine um adam green uh who will be showing some of his music and talking to us about um all manner of stuff adam's a very interesting guy san diego and uh Two weeks from now, we'll have Lansing McCloskey on, on April 23rd. Um, so thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, this, is face, this is a live situation, so uh, it's not perfect, but I really appreciate your time. And uh, please leave comments and suggestions. And uh, I wish you all a very good night. Stay healthy. Stay um, separated, except for the people that live in your house. And... Um, be well. We'll see you later. Thank you.